This is the STS-87 uh, mission, which launched on November 19th. This is myself, Kevin Kriegel, the commander. I'm holding up a cap for my son's uh, soccer team. We're suiting up, getting ready to, to launch. Uh, pilot Steve Lindsay, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force on his first mission. Dr. Kalpana Chavla, uh, also a rookie uh, mission specialist on her first mission. My classmate, uh, Navy Captain Winston Scott, on his second mission, getting ready to go. Uh, we've got Japanese mission specialist Takao Doi on his first uh, mission. And we have Colonel Leonid Ketanyuk from the Ukraine. Leonid is also uh, on his first mission. We're walking down the same ramp as uh, folks have been using since the beginning of the program on a beautiful morning getting ready to launch at the Kennedy Space Center. We go ahead and get strapped in, and that's myself. We're in the vertical. We normally strap in with the commander going first. It's about two and a half hours before the, the launch. The folks in the white suits are also uh, fellow astronauts that are helping us uh, get strapped in and are the last people to check us out, make sure that all our flight data file and all our equipment is in a proper procedure. There's Winston, who's our mission specialist, too, strapping in as the last person. Here we've moved ahead just a couple of hours. We're just a few minutes before launch now. During the last few seconds, the uh, computers take over, and if everything goes along okay, we're along for the ride. That swing back and forth is what we call the twang. There we're released from the uh, pad, and we are airborne. Passing the top of the tower, we're already going faster than 100 miles per hour. We're rolling to a heads down position and uh, the steering to on course. And here you can see big smiles on our faces because we're all so happy that we're airborne. The ride from Earth to orbit is only about eight and a half minutes. After the first two minutes, the solid rocket boosters are uh, done and they are expended. They are parachuted down into the water where our, our retrieval ships will pick them up and we'll refurbish them and reuse them again. So here you see the solids coming off and we continue into space on the space shuttle main engines. And what you're going to see now is uh, main engine cutoff, at least the results of it, where we're thrown forward in the seats. The external tank is ejected from the orbital and that's the residual fuel being vented from the tank as it tumbles back into the atmosphere and into the ocean. Once we're in orbit, the first thing we've got to do is get the payload bay doors open because that allows us to provide cooling to the orbiter and to the electronic systems. This is not real time. We don't do things quite that rapidly, but if we watch them in real time, we spend all day watching the doors open. And here you see a survey of the payload bay with all of the uh, experiments and the, the uh, cargo that we have inside of the bay. We did uh, a lot of experiments. We've turned it into a rocket ship, into a laboratory. Um, this is uh, a dendritic experiment. Um, also, we've got the uh, solar can. It's a Solsi looking at uh, the ozone layer, and it's opening up, and it'll look at the vertical distribution of the ozone as opposed to other satellites that look down at the horizontal or, or top-down view. The experiment was the United States Microgravity uh, Lab, and it was the fourth uh, flight of this. Uh, another big important payload was the Spartan satellite, and KC is checking out the Canadian robotic arm. Uh, our intention was to deploy this satellite on the third day and let it go for about two days, and it was going to collect data on the solar wind and solar uh, flares, and then we'd come back and retrieve it. So we, here we are unberthing the Spartan satellite doing our last-minute checkouts, and then we'll go ahead and release it. Uh, we're waiting for it to do a pirouette maneuver, and then we'll back away and let it fulfill its two-day mission. Unfortunately, uh, everything doesn't always go as planned, and as we were waiting there for the satellite to do its pirouette, nothing happened. So we go ahead and attempt to grapple the satellite and rebirth it and try to uh, see what's wrong with it, you'll see upcoming that in the attempt to uh, rebirth it, the satellite got tipped and had a rotation rate. We were unsuccessful in capturing uh, the satellite. So now we had a 3,000 pound satellite that we were trying to chase, and we chased it for about an hour trying to uh, match the rates and try to uh, retrieve it. Unfortunately, we reached our uh, bingo fuel or minimum fuel and was told by mission control that we had to back away from the satellite and at that time we really thought uh, that a major part of our mission had been unsuccessful 
but the folks down at the ground came up with a, a great plan uh, to retrieve the satellite manually and here you can see I've got my little satellite simulator thinking of how we're going to capture this thing if we come up to it and it's still rotating. And here you see Takao Doi and uh, myself Winston Scott inside of the airlock. We're checking out our suits getting ready for the first EVA. Now we've jumped ahead several hours obviously because Takao and I are perched on uh, foot restraints inside of the payload bay. Kevin and Steve have piloted the orbiter up to within arm's reach of the satellite. And what we're doing is just observing it now. We're watching for its motion, for its speed, for its direction, for the modes, getting ready to make the capture. Now I have to remind everybody here that because everything looks so slowly, it doesn't mean that, that it is. We're still moving around the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour with a 3,000 pound satellite above our heads. Uh, the next scene you're going to see is where we actually reach up and grapple and grab the satellite, and there we are. And you can see that we're rotating it forward so that we can get it to the proper orientation that will allow us to uh, berth the satellite into the payload bay. And there we are. We're moving the satellite down into the locking guides uh, to, so that we can lock it down and bring it back home again. Now, once we birthed the satellite, that was not the end of our EVA. As a matter of fact, we continue with the nominal timeline. Here you see me with the red stripes, and you see Takao on the left with a, a pure white suit. That's how you, you tell the uh, two EVA crewmen apart. This device that we're removing from the sidewall carrier is a mock-up of a space station battery. Now, this thing weighs about 550 pounds on Earth, but uh, in space, of course, it's weightless, but you still have 550 pounds worth of mass. Here I'm going to dock this battery to the crane, and now you see Takao testing this space station crane. Now this crane is to be used on orbit to move large masses around the International Space Station. On Earth, it will not hold its own weight, but in space, it will move hundreds of pounds of mass. It has a manual mode, and you saw Takao uh, using the hand crank just a minute ago. Now he's using a power tool to extend the boom on the crane. The uh, tests during this first spacewalk were, were marginally satisfactory. I had trouble docking this large battery to the crane, and for that reason, we're going to do a, space, a second spacewalk later on where we'll look at other docking techniques. Now here I'm removing the mass from the crane as Takao pitches it down. And we're going to redeposit the mass into its sidewall carrier, and we'll move on with some other experiments. Takao Doi was the first Japanese astronaut to walk in space, and here he's issuing a greeting to all of his uh, people back home. And at the end of seven hours and 43 minutes, you see me entering the airlock at the end of the uh, EVA. We're going to close the airlock up, repressurize, and go back to our, our internal activities. We also had a joint payload called Q with the Ukrainians and uh, the American scientists. And it was looking at about 10 different experiments on plant growth. Uh, this plant that Leonid is getting ready to pollinate is a Brassica rapid. It's kind of the mustard seed family. We're looking at how the effects of microgravity and radiation have on plants and their uh, pollinations. Because if, when we go to space for longer lengths of time, we're probably going to have to grow our own uh, plants and food. And here's Leonid showing a full-grown uh, Brassica rapa. They grow uh, very well in space. Leonid was a great farmer, and he kept busy as a bee. We also talked to students, because they were doing very similar experiments while we were in orbit, uh, both in the Ukraine and in the United States. Behind Leonid, you can see the Ukrainian flag, as he was the first Ukrainian to fly on the space shuttle. Every day, we also worked with a mid-deck glove box and you can see KC and Steve. We had three different experiments. One was the enclosed laminar flame. The other one was the particle engulfment of pushing by solids and liquids. And another was the wetting characteristics of emissibles. And this are different experiments that we can use in a glove box so it's not contaminating the mid-deck. The uh, flame experiments will help us understand jet engines a little bit better. The particle experiments helps us understand how we can get pure uh, type of materials in space. And the immiscibles is a liquid experiment, seeing how two different liquids interface, sort of like if you take you know, oil and vinegar and shook them up and you'd see how the, the different materials would solidify or, or uh, 
go out into different type of uh, solution. And there's Casey and myself working on the uh, globe block experiment. Here we're preparing for the second spacewalk, and you can see uh, KC helping Takao to don his spacesuit. Uh, Takao's on the right side, and uh, I'm on the left side there, and uh, we've got everything on but the helmets now. You can see his communications carry with the microphones uh, down by the mouth. Here you'll see me take a sip out of my drink bag in just a second. If you're going to be outdoors, uh, so to speak, for six or eight hours, you've got to have drinking water, and we carry drink bags inside of our suit. KC is our internal coordinator, or our IVA, and she's checking the checklist to be sure that we don't miss something before we depressurize that airlock and go outside. Before we started the EVA, we lifted the Spartan satellite out of the bay again, not to release it, but to check out the VGS, or the Video Guidance System. These are laser reflectors, and this system is going to be part of an automatic docking system that can be used on the shuttle or other spacecraft to rendezvous and dock with the space station. Now we're into the spacewalk again. You can see Takao on top, and uh, I'm on the bottom, and we're setting the crane up this second time around. And as I mentioned earlier, this time we're going to test docking small masses to the crane grid. Now this small mass here, this, this spool-looking thing, is just that. It's a, a cable caddy or a uh, circular device with cable wound around it. It will be the, the way that we'll transport electrical cables, data cables, fluid line cables, and, and so on into space. And you can see I am uh, have just a little bit of trouble docking that uh, small ORU to the crane. But once I got the technique down, we, we had several successful dockings and an overall successful test of the crane. Uh, Takao is uh, again moving the crane, this time with the small mass. He's concerned about the uh, dynamics of the crane, how smoothly it operates, uh, how much it oscillates, and, and so on. Uh, a lot of things to be concerned with uh, with a crane like that on orbit. Here, I'm launching a device called the AirCam Sprint, and the, the Sprint is the basketball-looking uh, flying object you see there on the screen. It's actually a robotically controlled camera system that is flown by a pilot, Steve Lindsay, from inside of the space shuttle. These are pictures that are taken from the, uh, are taken by the Sprint, and they're beamed back to Earth and back inside of the shuttle. The idea for this device is that if you have uh, a need to survey the outside of your space station or spaceship, you can use this robotically controlled camera to do just that prior to sending people outside. Here again, pictures from the Sprint. Now here's a picture of me, Winston, taken through the eyes of the robot. Steve is flying the camera back into my arms. The uh, control was so precise that I could give him calls such as you're six inches away, okay, you're five inches, you're four inches, and he was able to guide it, it directly back into my hands with, with much precision. Again, uh, I'm standing poised, ready to capture the camera, I'll power it down, and uh, we'll take it back into the airlock and we'll be done with that experiment. This is the first time that uh, an experiment like that has been flown in space. Well, we did have to relax a little, and of course we had to eat. You can see uh, I'm laying on the, the ceiling, or really just uh, got in myself position. Um, things can get quite crowded, but you can use all different volumes. Um, I'm doing just a little science experiment with pliers to see how it rotates one way, and if I open up the pliers a little bit more, it actually has two levels of rotation. We did exercise every day, and here's uh, Steve Lindsay proving that pilots can do exercise and chew gum at the same time. And he's doing the American front roll, and we've got Leonid uh, countering it with the Ukrainian uh, backflip. And we had some tight spaces, but we also try to enjoy ourselves when we're given the time. Nose KC, we spin her up, and using the principal's moment of inertia, she actually slows down when she opens her arms up, just like a, a, a skater would on ice. We all uh, slept in different places. This is myself sleeping on the, the flight deck in our sleeping bag. Uh, we had four of the folks in sleep stations on the mid-deck, and Leonid also slept uh, on the mid-deck on the wall. A large percentage of our time on orbit is taken up by, uh, by taking pictures. We take still pictures, moving pictures, you name it, we do it. Here are, uh, a, here's a video of the Himalayas, 
And the thing that's so cool about taking pictures from space is that you can see the browns of the uh, deserts, of the dirt. You can see the, the black tops of the mountains. You can also see the snow and the clouds. And here, uh, the deep blue of the ocean. Now, what you see at the lower right-hand side of the screen is the northwest corner of the African continent. We're actually coming over the uh, Sahara Desert. And you can see just how rich and beautiful those colors really are. It's incredible to watch entire continents go by beneath you in just a matter of minutes. These are jet firings as we get ready to come home. We're getting ready to do our deorbit burn now and the uh, jets firing uh, through the window. As we intersect the atmosphere, the outside of the vehicle begins to heat up and that's what that glow was. When we go subsonic, we make uh, two booms over the Kennedy Space Center and we're showing our contrails. Uh, the commander takes control of it. You're looking through uh, our heads-up display. This is what both uh, myself and Steve Lindsay are seeing. We've got airspeed on the left, altitude on the right, and a little diamond is where I'm trying to keep centered up. Uh, we'll roll out and see the Kennedy Space Center. We'll be about six miles away, 12,000 feet up, and we're pointing down about 20 degrees nose low. Pretty steep approach, and of course, we're a glider. We're doing about 300 miles per hour, just sinking like a rock. There's no go-around capability. We want to make sure we get it right the, the first time. At 2,000 feet, I'll bring the nose up gently to land in more of an attitude like an airliner. And Steve will go ahead at 300 feet. I'll put the gear down, get ready for the final touchdown. Our aim is to land on those black marks about 2,500 feet down the runway at about 200 uh, miles per hour. Uh, we managed to put it down right where we wanted. There's a uh, fairly a good touchdown and it was nice to, to get back home after spending 16 days in space. Uh, once I have a touchdown, um, I'll go ahead and have Steve put out the parachute and that aids us in our braking capability so we don't have to heat up the brakes. And then I'll lower the nose and we'll uh, proceed to uh, slow down. At 60 knots, Steve will go ahead and jettison uh, the parachute. And that's so the drag chute doesn't drape over the uh, engine bells and cause any uh, type of damage. But it's really kind of a mixed feeling after coming back in space. You're, you're ready to get home and see your family and take a shower and eat some real food, but you also miss the uh, incredible experience it is to, to work as a crew in space. Um, it takes about uh, 30 to 45 minutes to do all the post-flight landing checks and to get us out of the, the vehicle. But we go ahead and walk it around, and uh, Columbia r really was a fine machine. There you see myself on the left doing some of our post-landing checks, and it worked just uh, perfectly for us. And there's Steve on uh, the right. And real shortly, you'll see uh, the whole crew standing in front of, the, of uh, our vehicle after our 16-day mission. And that was STS-87 uh, in November, December, 1997. Thanks for listening.